Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. First of all, thank you for being here. Jenny, so great to have you uh, and to see you. Um, our speaker today is Jennifer Bacci, who is a PharmD, and she is the endowed Associate Professor of Innovative Pharmacy Practice at the University of Washington School of Pharmacy in Seattle. Her research focuses on the application of implementation science to evaluate and advance the adoption of innovative patient care models in community pharmacy practice. She has investigated the implementation of a variety of community pharmacy pharmacy-based um, patient care services and practice management supports, such as childhood and adult vaccinations, point-of-care testing, chronic disease management, pharmacies prescribing, and medical billing. Um, Dr. Bachi completed her PharmD at Pitt Pharmacy in 2011, followed by a PGY-1 community-based pharmacy residency with Pitt Pharmacy and Rite Aid. And after working full-time in community pharmacy, she returned to Pitt Pharmacy to complete a two-year community pharmacy research fellowship and Master of Public Health. We are so happy to have you and we can't wait to hear what you have to share with us. So I'll just turn it over to you. And once again, thanks everyone for being here. And Dr. Bashi, thanks for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much and good afternoon, everyone. I am honored to, to be invited to present for CPPI in a, another program that is well known and has a strong reputation for supporting and advancing practice. I will go ahead and share my slides now. All right, just wanna confirm before we get started that everyone can see the slides, great. So today I'm gonna be sharing with you a study that we conducted at University of Washington um, in, in community pharmacy uh, focused on closing statin gaps in diabetes care. And we, we call it the GUIDE S study, so you may hear me refer to it that way. There's information about claiming credit that Sydney will put into the chat towards the end of today's presentation. I do need to disclose that I received grant funding from UCB Pharma, but that is for a separate research study than the one I'm presenting on today. And by the end of today's session, you'll be able to explain the utility of hybrid implementation effectiveness study designs in pharmacy-based practice research, describe the potential impact of community pharmacists on closing statin gaps in care in people with type 2 diabetes, and recall strategies for partnering with community pharmacies on practice-based research. So a little bit of background. There's very strong, clear evidence that statin therapy can help reduce the risk of morbidity and mortality um, re related to cardiovascular risk in people with type 2 diabetes. But despite this clear evidence, there's also very strong evidence that gaps in the statin therapy exist. Patients who are indicated for statins never make it onto a statin, or they struggle with adherence to a statin. And so community pharmacists have been identified as a potential strategy to close these gaps in care. There are several studies that have shown positive outcomes from community pharmacist-led interventions to identify people with type 2 diabetes not on a statin. And the two shown here are examples conducted by Renner and team and, and Drake and colleagues. These two studies in particular focused on patients with type 2 diabetes are in, in the age group of 40 to 75. So that aligns with the statin use in people with diabetes health plan performance measure. Um, they also, the pharmacy staff were required to contact the prescriber via telephone or fax to initiate prescribing. And so the, the difference in the study I'm gonna share with you today is while the health plan performance measure uh, focuses on 40 to 75, there's still evidence that statins may benefit individuals lower than the age of 40 with diabetes or higher than the age of 75. And based on our uh, practice laws in Washington, we were able to focus on an extended age range. Um, we were also able to use a collaborative practice agreement for pharmacists to actually prescribe the statins. And so we developed an intervention, what we call the guide us, guide us intervention to do just that. So the intervention starts with the use of an electronic alert in a pharmacy dispensing system that was built to identify patients aged 18 to 84 years old who had filled at least 60 day, a 60 day supply of one non-insulin diabetes medication in a rolling six month period and who had not filled a statin. 
and these alerts load into the pharmacy system every two weeks. When, they, when the alerts load, that notifies pharmacy staff or cues pharmacy staff up to proactively engage that patient in a discussion about their statin therapy and whether it might be appropriate for them. From there, there's really three paths that can happen. One, the patient may refuse. Second, the patient may prefer that the pharmacist is not the one prescribing, so the prescriber can do um, can facilitate acquisition of a prescription for a statin from another prescriber. So similar to previous studies that may use fax or telephone. Or the third, the pharmacist has the collaborative practice agreement that they can proceed with prescribing the statin. And so if that's the route the patient takes, the pharmacist, of course, conducts a thorough history uh, to make sure that there's not any contraindications to care. They also um, will check labs. Our, in our intervention, we designed that the, I, the first step in checking labs is seeing if the patient has access to their labs on their health portal. If the patient doesn't have access to their health portal or their labs were done more than three months ago, the pharmacist could um, prescribe the labs and send the patient to the local, the local facility if they were a patient there or the pharmacist could obtain a uh, due point of care testing lot right in the pharmacy. From there, the pharmacists were able to initiate a prescribe the statin and then provide individualized education. All of the patients who are initiated on a statin, whether the pharmacist prescribed the statin or facilitated the prescription from another prescriber, they received individualized education and follow up for a one year time period. The first, in, the first follow-up period was always 28 days, but then after that, the pharmacist had uh, the authority to determine the best time for follow-up. So it could range from 28 to 84 days based on the patient's risk of non-adherence and their overall stability. So then we, of course, wanted to design a study to evaluate the effectiveness of this intervention. And so the primary outcome of our study was to evaluate its impact on statin initiation in people with type 2 diabetes. And our secondary objectives were to evaluate the impact of the intervention on statin adherence, as well as evaluate the pharmacist's self-reported perceptions of the intervention's feasibility and their fidelity to the intervention. And I'll talk a little bit more about what those words mean as we go along. So because we were using, uh, we were implementing a an intervention, we use specific strategies to implement it in the pharmacies. Uh, you can see those strategies listed here. At a very high level, our strategies and, and supports included things like um, developing a 15-page manual with all the protocols, guidelines, forms, and documentation templates that the teams would need. The pharmacists were required to complete a computer-based training that both reviewed kind of the clinical pieces of this intervention, as well as went over the, the processes and the protocols required. And then within two weeks of completing that training, each pharmacy received a visit from a member of the implementation team. So this study, our, this study was a type one hybrid effectiveness implementation study that was conducted at nine intervention pharmacies and 18 control pharmacies within one large community pharmacy chain in Washington state. Uh, patient enrollment was conducted from August 8th to August 8th, 2018 to December 31st, 2019. And then there was a 12 month follow-up period which concluded on December 31st, 2020. Before we get more into the detail of the methods, let's first talk a bit about hybrid effectiveness implementation studies and implementation outcomes. The traditional research pipeline, which is shown here on, on the figure on the screen, has encouraged a staged approach to evidence-based intervention development. And as a result, there tends to be a significant time lag between the development of an evidence-based intervention and the, its routine uptake in real world practice. So you may often hear about uh, the, the no do gap or the fact that it can take 20 years to get an evidence-based intervention into real world use. Field of implementation science has developed what we call hybrid studies that combine the elements of effective neat research 
with implementation research. And the benefits of doing this, at, doing both types of research at the same time are that we include consideration for the complexity of real world settings, uh, which lends itself to greater external validity. Um, and it also can increase the, the speed at which interventions are used in practice. There are three types of hybrid studies, type one, type two, and type three. They vary based on their primary focus and the amount of emphasis on the effectiveness piece versus the implementation piece. So type one studies focus primarily on the effectiveness outcomes while exploring the implementability of the intervention. Type two has a dual focus, so more 50-50 between the effectiveness piece and the implementation piece. And then finally, type three focuses on primarily on the implementation outcomes and really testing of specific implementation strategies while also collecting effectiveness outcomes as they relate to uptake or fidelity of the intervention. And so the study that we're discussing today was a type one. If you recall, our primary outcome was to evaluate the impact of our intervention on statin initiation. And then our secondary outcomes were related to implementation, specifically fidelity and feasibility. There are actually eight implementation outcomes. We're all probably more familiar with the traditional effectiveness outcomes of things like morbidity and mortality and disease indicators. When considering implementation, we have a whole separate set of outcomes that we look at that are intended to measure the effects of deliberate and purposeful action to implement new services. And so these outcomes are all indicators of implementation progress and success. As I mentioned, there's eight core indicators, um, but for time today, I'm gonna just go over the two that we focused on for this study. So we were particularly interested in feasibility, which is the extent to which a service can be successfully carried out or used within a given setting. And then we were also interested in fidelity, which is the degree to which the service is implemented as intended. So it's a form of measuring adherence for practitioners. And we felt that it was really important to measure fidelity um, because if you can have an, an intervention that works, but if an, you don't get good outcomes, you wanna know if you didn't get good outcomes because the intervention doesn't work or because it wasn't implemented well. So back to the methods for the guide us study. Um, we'll start by looking at the methods for our statin initiation and adherence outcomes. We used a prospective quasi-experimental design. The primary outcome was time to statin initiation, and we defined that as the time to receive a statin fill within 12 months from a patient-specific index date. For patients in our intervention group, the index date was defined as 84 days before the alert in the pharmacy system was closed. If 84 days before the closed date occurred before the intervention start date, then the intervention start date was used as the index date. So what that all really means is, unfortunately, within the dispensing system, we couldn't track what day the alerts actually loaded into, like dropped into a queue for the pharmacy staff. But the system was able to track the date that the, the staff closed the intervention. And so we knew that the staff had up to 84 days from the day the intervention loaded to the day that it closed. And so we use that math to generate patient-specific index states. We used a Cox proportional hazards model to compare statin initiation over a 12-month period in intervention patients as compared to control patients. And we matched each intervention patient to two control patients who had a prescription fill within 30 days before or after of the intervention patient's index date. Our model was also built to control for age, gender, insurance status, number of unique medications as a proxy for overall comor comorbidities, and then select medications as a proxy for cardiovascular risk. So those included things like ACE inhibitors, angiotensin renin blockers, metformin, GLP-1 agonists, and SGL-2 inhibitors. For statin adherence, 
uh, we looked at interventions or intervention patients with a confirmed statin fill resulting from the study. The control group for this side of the analysis included patients aged 18 to 84 who had filled at least two diabetes medications at a control pharmacy in a rolling six month period. Our primary adherence outcome was proportionate days covered for a statin over 12 months. We used linear regression to evaluate the effect on, of the intervention on continuous PDC. And then we used logistic regress, regression to estimate the effect of the intervention using a binary adherence threshold that we defined as PDC greater than or equal to 80%. Moving on to our implementation outcomes, which were feasibility and fidelity, we used an anonymous survey to assess pharmacist perceptions of feasibility and fidelity. So the, these were pharmacists at our nine intervention pharmacies. We administered the survey at six months and 12 months post intervention implementation. We use the implementation outcomes questionnaire feasibility, which is to look at feasibility. And this is a validated uh, measure instrument developed by LeVay and team. Um, respondents are asked to indicate agreement with eight items using a six point Likert scale with one meaning strongly disagree and six meaning strongly agree. You can, from that scale, you can compute a feasibility score that is um, from calculating the average results for all items. And so a feasibility score of greater than or equal to 3.5 means that the service is perceived to be uh, feasible and a feasibility score of less than 3.5 suggests that the intervention is perceived to not be highly feasible. For fidelity, we used an adapted version of the comprehensive medication management patient care process fidelity assessment, again, a validated tool developed by LeVay and team. The adapted tool consisted of 38 items detailing each step of our uh, intervention process across five domains that aligned with the pharmacist patient care process. So similar to collect, assess, plan, implement, and follow up. Pharmacists were instructed to indicate the percentage of GUIDAS patients for which they completed each step of the process. They could also respond, I haven't had the opportunity to complete this step or I don't complete this step as part of my process. Responses were then aggregated at the do domain level and analyzed descriptively. So let's get into the results, starting with our findings related to statin initiation. We had 1,679 intervention patients matched to 3,358 control patients. On average, our control patients were sl slightly older and more likely to be female with government-funded insurance. And we actually knew to expect this. Uh, patients with government-funded insurance were ineligible for the pharmacist to initiate a statin via uh, the collaborative practice agreement for the majority of the patient enrollment period due to the community pharmacy partners interpretation of a federal regulation defining providers and provider enrollment criteria. However, the pharmacist could still facilitate acquisition of a statin prescription for these patients from another prescriber. About partway through the study in September of 2019, um, the pharmacy partner obtained a new reinterpretation of that regulation. And so we were able to start including patients with government funded insurance at that point. Um, so while our, our populations, don't, our two groups don't totally match, we do understand kind of what was likely causing that. Overall, 26.3% of interventions compared to of intervention patients compared to 25.4% of control patients initiated a statin. Interestingly, only 12 patients or 2.7% of intervention patients initiated a statin prescribed by the pharmacist. So the majority of our patients who initiated statin went the route of the facilitating a prescription from another prescriber. So the likelihood of, of statin is, uh, initiation was not significantly different between the two, two groups. Now we can look at statin adherence. So recall that this, the intervention patients who had documented statin initiation as a result of the intervention were included in this analysis. 
and then matched a control group. So we had 185 patients in the intervention group for the statin adherence outcomes, and they were matched to 370 control patients. We saw similar demographics between the two groups. Um, in general, control, control patients were slightly older and more likely to be female with government funded insurance for, for similar reasons as previously described. After adjustment, we found that the mean proportion of days covered was 3.1% higher in the intervention group. Um, and we found that the intervention group was 21.2% more likely to have a PDC greater than or equal to 80%. However, neither of those findings were statistically significant. Now on to feasibility. And so you can see based on the table uh, on the slide, you can see the eight items that comprise this scale. They ask things like the amount of time to implement the service is manageable, financial resources, time to document, as well as preparation. And then pharmacists could indicate their extent of agreement. You can also see uh, the results for six months post-implementation and 12 months post-implementation. And for ease of viewing for this presentation, I combined um, all the disagrees and all, all the agrees. So the numbers that you're seeing represent agreement uh, with slightly to strong on the slightly to strong range. So we had 15 pharmacists complete the survey at six months post-implementation and 12 months complete 12 pharmacists complete the 12 month post-implementation survey. You can see that pharmacists perception of the amount of time required to provide the intervention, the staff needed to carry out the intervention, and pharmacists having adequate time to deliver the inter intervention generally improve from six to 12 months. Perceptions of the financial resources required and the amount of time for documentation and preparation for carrying out the service generally remain the same. At six months, the feasibility score was calculated to be four, and at 12 months, it was 4.2. Recall that anything over 3.5 indicates that the service is likely to be feasible in the setting. And our final outcome was fidelity. So in the, the graph that you're seeing on the screen, this shows at the domain level. Um, and so our, the domains included identifying and engaging eligible patients, collecting and assessing appropriateness of a statin, prescribing a statin and communicating that with the patient and other providers, facilitating acquisition of a statin prescription and communicating that, and then following up. The darker gray represents uh, adherence or fidelity to the protocol at six months and the lighter gray is 12 months. So overall in general, you can see that fidelity decreased from six to 12 months. At six months, fidelity was highest for collecting and assessing appropriateness followed by prescribing and communicating. Fidelity was lowest for identifying and engaging eligible patients and facilitating and communication. At 12 months, fidelity was highest for prescribing and communicating and lowest for facilitating and communicating. So what did we think that this all meant? Well, first, this was one of the first studies to evaluate pharmacists initiating statins using a collaborative practice agreement. Um, but we found that actually the pharmacists prescribed statins for a very small percent of the patients included. And we think that that has to do with the difference of in time and complexity involved in initiating a statin via CPA versus acquiring another prescription. Um, they're in a busy community pharmacy. It takes some time to check labs or to send the patient to go get additional labs or even to wait for the results of a point of care test. Um, the liver test that we were using was a, a mail away. So it took about two days to get the results. Um, so we think that a collaborative practice agreement is a, a great tool for those patients that a pharmacist may need to use it for, but it's not sufficient alone to improve statin use in people with type, D, type 2 diabetes. And in fact, we think based on the number of patients that preferred uh, another prescriber, we think that patients appear, prefer more collaborative 
approach, particularly given this is a chronic therapy. It's not necessarily something that a patient's going to be on for a few days, rather something they may be on for the rest of their life. There are a few limitations that should be noted. Um, we may have had systematic differences between our intervention and control sites due to the lack of randomization. Um, they were, were in geographically separate parts of the state. So our intervention group was in um, Southwest Washington, close to Oregon, and our, um, our control group was more in South Sound, a little bit closer to Seattle, Tacoma. Um, the general demographics of the communities were about the same, um, but we wanted to prevent the chance of movement of pharmacists and patients between the, the intervention and control arms. Um, we had to make assumptions related to the patient index dates. If you recall, I mentioned we, we weren't able to obtain the date, the date that the alerts loaded in the system, just the date that the alerts were resolved, indicated as resolved by the pharmacy staff. We had to control for insurance type due to the overrepresentation of patients with government-funded insurance in our control group. And then we did use a statin fill data from the pharmacy rather than insurance claims to calculate PDC. So there is a chance that we may have missed statin fills um, from another pharmacy. So overall, our intervention did result in more patients initiating statin therapy and a higher statin adherence as compared to usual care. However, the differences were not statistically significant. Based on our implementation outcomes, we think that there's sufficient evidence that the intervention is likely to be effective, but there's some more work that's needed on the implementation side, whether that's implementation strategies or implementation context, um, or as we may call it on the practice side, additional practice management supports. And so we think some of the things that may assist that are increasing patient awareness of statin therapy availability and pharmacists' ability to prescribe that. Um, integrating more pharmacist-physician communication via the electronic health record, since that um, is believed to be just the most efficient process. And then a more structured, implementing this intervention in a more structured patient care workflow may be beneficial, but the downside of that could potentially be that um, patients, it may require appointments and that may be more difficult for patients. I'd like to acknowledge the study team, my co-PI, Peggy Odegaard, and the rest of the team members, including my colleagues, Asta Bonsell, Ryan Hansen, Zach Markham, Trisha Rodriguez, Tara Fund, and Jenny Kim. I'd also like to acknowledge the funders of this study, the NACDS Foundation. And before I wrap up today, Dr. Salgado asked me to speak briefly about our experience working with community pharmacies on research. Um, we've We've quite a rich history of that in Washington state. And a lot of that comes down to the symbiotic relationship between scholarship and practice transformation. Many of the practice advancements that we're known for in Washington state actually started with a grant. Before the grants, it really started with some great foresight. The last time our practice act was opened up in 1979, um, that allows pharmacists to prescribe essentially anything under a collaborative practice agreement. Um, so our laws, in our law, we don't have to get explicit permission for everything we're hoping to prescribe. Rather, we have a broad collaborative practice law. And so that allowed us to pursue innovations like immunizations and contraceptions in the 90s that all started with a research grant. What we know is that community pharmacists are actually truly interested in, in participating in research opportunities if there is mutual benefit. So if the research can help improve care delivery, increase knowledge and innovation, change patients' perspectives about pharmacy, and increase patient satisfaction and loyalty. So the Robert Wood Johnson's Foundation and Oliver Weinman actually created a, a simple framework that can help researchers and organizations that are looking to drive change and impact scale in healthcare. So this framework is meant to help researchers better engage payers and providers in mutually beneficial frameworks and mutually beneficial partnerships. 
Uh, the framework provides a starting point for researchers to consider which types of organizations they should partner with in their endeavor, the potential receptivity of the organization, and what topics the organization will be most interested in. And the six key uh, indicators for that include mission focus of the organizations, operational focus, innovation focus, or, or willingness to take on some risk with innovation, consumer and patient focus, uh, where they all are on the spectrum of moving to value-based healthcare, uh, community focus, and then advocacy. I've been doing community-based research now for almost 10 years, and I think that, that that framework is pretty spot on. A few lessons learned that I've had along the way of, um, has been that it takes time to build relationships with community pharmacies to help them trust me as a researcher. Um, one of the things that I found to be particularly helpful was showing up to things that our community pharmacy partners are interested in. So showing up to our state association, being active in the associations that are advocating for community pharmacy. I think that that helped improve their trust and help them see that um, we were working towards the same goals. Another key lesson learned for me was the best research questions come from practice. And so a lot of my research I tried, it's not necessarily ideas that I came up with, but in listening to our partners and hearing about their challenges, their patients' needs, and designing studies to help address and improve that. I think the last and, and important piece in working with community pharmacy in particular to other practice-based areas is that sustainability piece and uh, really thinking from the get-go about how this work could be continued beyond a grant um, and could bring in additional sources of revenue for the pharmacy. So in, in wrapping this up, I have three assessment questions to see, see how everyone did. So we'll go through that really quick and I'll invite you all to drop your answers to each into the chat. So the first question is, which of the following is a benefit of hybrid effectiveness implementation study designs? They decrease the time and cost of conducting practice-based research. They increase the likelihood of observing an intervention effect if it exists. They decrease the time between development of an evidence-based intervention and routine uptake in practice, or D, increases internal validity. So again, I'll give everyone a second to drop their answer into the chat. Dr. Bocci, can you see the chat or do you need me to share with you? I have it up, I can see it. Oh, great. Excellent. Seeing a lot of C. Yeah, seeing a lot of Cs, which is absolutely correct. Uh, the main, one of the main benefits of this design is that it decreases that, it can decrease that no-do gap. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's less expensive or we're more likely to observe an effect. And they're more like they increase external validity more so than internal validity because they have more of that pragmatic approach. The second question is, which of the following was a finding of the guide us study? A, the community pharmacist prescribed statin therapy for most enrolled patients via the collaborative practice agreement. The community pharmacist intervention resulted in more patients initiating statin therapy. The community pharmacist perceived the intervention was less likely to be feasible. And the community pharmacist intervention decreased statin adherence. Feel free to, once again, put your response into the chat. So with this one, the correct answer is B. While this finding was not statistically significant, there was a higher percentage of intervention patients that started a statin and in comparison to the control group. Um, if you recall, it was actually a low percentage of patients that the pharmacist prescribed the statin for, um, but the pharmacist did perceive that the intervention was likely to, was feasible. The final question is, 
which of the following are indicators that researchers can use to determine strength of alignment when partnering with community pharmacies for research? A, innovation focus, B, mission vo focus, C, move to value-based healthcare, D, patient focus, or E, all of the above. Seen a lot of ease in the chat, which is absolutely correct. All of these are indicators that we can use to assess um, the, the potential for a successful partnership. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and would be happy to answer any questions. And those in the classroom, feel free to use these mics and you can ask through the Zoom. Any questions? Well, if not, we'll get, we'll finish up and sorry. wrap up here. Oh, I did have ahead. a, sorry, just a, a quick question to you. I think it was striking to me as, you know, seeing the, the, the results that the, the 2.7 or 2. Point something percent of folks that ended up going through the intervention arm. And you mentioned some, some ideas about what may have driven that, but were you able to get structured feedback from some of the, the, the patients or participants as to why that was uh, such a low yield? Yeah, that's a great question. We did not collect uh, structured data. We do have some anecdotal feedback on that. Um, so we know that there, there were many instances in which patients had prescriptions for statins on file that they never filled. And so when the patient or when the pharmacist proactively engaged them, there was uh, some segment of patients where the pharmacist, they already had a prescription there and they were able to, to fill it um, with the patient's acceptance. Um, the pharmacist, there was, there's a large health system in that area that had um, a physician from that health system was the one who actually signed our, C our CPA. And the pharmacists do have read-write ability in uh, that health system's EHR. So there was also a, a group of patients where it was just really easy for the pharmacist to send a note and get a prescription. And that took a lot less time for the pharmacist than... Um, to go through the process of collecting all the information, obtaining the labs and so forth. Um, and so I think that you know, my kind of main takeaways, I think we need to equip community pharmacists with a tool belt of sorts. You know, not every patient has different needs. And so a collaborative practice agreement can be great if a patient does not have established care and the pharmacist can do that. Um, but to promote team-based care, it really does make sense um, from an efficiency standpoint, um, if needed, and it, where possible to engage the patient's other providers in that decision. Um, and so I think that it's, there's having the pharmacist be screening for patients who should be on a statin is, is a helpful way to increase patients on statins. And then giving them different routes that they can go based on any individual patient's need to actually get them on a statin. Did that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's maybe one of the most, one of the more interesting things that come out of this, that it's sometimes we're so focused on that, uh, that, that prescribing step that we maybe don't take into account all of the other uh, pieces of the puzzle, right? It's not just the decision to prescribe, but it's also the infrastructure to execute it, that the follow-up, it sounds like what you're describing as well is is a big part of that, that yeah, maybe we're not quite as ready as we might've hoped that we were for that. I, I do have a, another follow-up question if, if we have time, if that's okay. Sorry, I, I ask a lot of questions, but um, since we have, we have a lot of students here today, um, in terms of the study design for this, can you can you talk about issues of consent, and and how this how you set up this type of a a project? If I 
I mean, I, I apologize if I miss it, but it doesn't sound like this was something where, you know, we had to prospectively obtain consent from all of these patients. Can you kind of talk through the dynamics surrounding that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's very common in implementation research that we randomize and collect data more at a practice level than a patient level. Um, but we, you know, when, when doing pragmatic consent research, that's always a consideration is consent. Um, because that is from a busy pharmacy standpoint, you know, when I worked in pharmacies, it, it's a lot to add the pharmacy team to take on consent on top of all of their other responsibilities. And the need for consent comes down to risk to the patients. And so in designing our studies, we're always considering risk to the patient and trying to minimize that so that that minimizes the impact in terms of times and tasks on the pharmacy team. And so for something like this, um, everything that we did was within the pharmacist's scope of practice. And so this was all designed where the patient was consenting for the care that they were receiving at the pharmacy. We then retrospectively pulled de-identified data from the pharmacy's dispensing system. Um, and so because we never saw any identifiable information, our IRB deemed this as low risk. Um, and we had a waiver to uh, inform to in consent. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, I think I have one. It seems like this is something that is critical for uh, community-based pharmacies that are affiliated with a health system. Like you said, like obtaining a CPA with, you know, providers within the health system where the pharmacists could have privileges to, you know, place orders and things of that sort. How do you foresee this sort of playing out in, like larger retail based pharmacists like CVS and Walgreens where pharmacists really have the ambition to implement programs like this, but we know the hurdles that are associated with establishing a CPA, maintaining a CPA and things of that sort. Um, again, I think it lends to the discussion of, you know, um, provider privileges for pharmacists where we can easily just initiate these types of interventions that are patient focused, but it seems like we still have significant hurdles that we need to overcome. Yeah, and that's a great question. Um, so this study was done in a large supermarket chain, which is, you know, on, on the spectrum of community pharmacy, that's different than independence, but that's also different than your, tradi your traditional chain community pharmacy. Um, and it was also unique in that the, the chain, the community pharmacy partner had um, a relationship with this health, local health system. Um, I, I think that uh, the biggest consideration in my mind before even talking about health systems and other providers is patients' acceptance of our ability to do this. You know, patient, we're now at a point where patients are very, I think, post-COVID especially, very accepting of certain um, acute interventions we make for acute situations. So they're very accepting of vaccines, right? That's a potentially one-time thing. Uh, not something that patients are taking every day. We're seeing more growing acceptance for point of care testing for acute conditions and initiation or prescribing of an antibiotic or an antiviral like we've seen for COVID or flu and strep. Um, but the statin is really, a, we're talking about a, now the pharmacist is getting involved in starting a medicine that the patient could be on the rest of their life. And I think that we need to, we can learn a lot from what we've gone through with these other services like immunizations, uh, now point of care testing about how we can expedite, uh, what strategies we can use to expedite patients acceptance and willingness of pharmacists and pharmacy teams in this way. And then I think it comes to that question of what makes sense in any given community. It's, it's not uh, these aren't all one size fits all, which is, is hard for a chain where you're talking about potentially hundreds of locations across state lines with different scopes of practice. And so that's where I think that kind of having a spectrum of, of a tool belt of whether it's read, write in the HR or the collaborative practice agreement, which are, I think that my, my opinion is those are particularly helpful 
when patients don't have established care. And we've seen some of that in the work from the CLEPSERs in the Midwest with point of care testing with flu and strep, um, that they were able to I, offer the point of care testing um, for patients who did not have established care, but then link them into established care. And so I think that's um, should be part of kind of how we think about design and approaching this moving forward. We have time for any more questions, a few more minutes. I have gone ahead and put the CE information in the chat. So if anybody needs that before they um, log off or need to go, but is there any more questions? I'll ask one more, sorry. Um, so I think from a safety standpoint from implementing programs like this is the issue of the pharmacy that when you're starting patient on a high intensity statin, you may not always have the preview of knowing all the medications that are on. And there may be a risk of initiating high dose statin and there could be an interactive medication that could put the patient at risk that the pharmacist may not be aware of. How potentially could we also combat some of those issues? Yeah. So for time, I didn't go into all the, the minutia of the intervention, but that was part of the expectation was that pharmacists, if they were prescribing the statin, they needed to be collecting the any information they need to make a thorough assessment of uh, indication effectiveness and safety and adherence uh, in prescribing that, that statin for the patient. Um, and so they could use their pharmacy dispensing records, but also... Um, interview the patient to, to capture that information. The, the collaborative practice agreement also gave the pharmacist the ability to modify. So say they started a patient on a medication and the patient was experiencing some adherence barriers, or maybe they were feeling a little bit of muscle pain and wanted to try, got a little scared and wanted to try something else. The pharmacist could adjust dosing, could change the statin. Um, and so I, again, it's, it's not a, prescribe and be finished, there's, you prescribe and then you follow up to continue that. Um, but I think that it, when we are prescribing, we are taking on the responsibility of making sure that what we are prescribing is indicated effective and safe for that patient. Thank you. There's no more questions. I'll just close by saying I, thank you so much. And oh, I have a question. question. Yeah, but I can start my video for some reason. Um, but yeah, so I guess to me, the, the results are surprising. And I love Dr. Ventasso's questions. Um, and I really hit the nail in the head. And I'm going to ask something that maybe it's, I don't know if it's harmful to us or not as pharmacists, but do you think that this, so it sounds like patients go down the route of having statins prescribed by another provider, um, which is understandable when, you know, when they're not co-located, when the care may, may not be just right there and done. And so I wonder if in community pharmacy, sometimes the effort that we make or the um, emphasis that we put on the need for CPAs for us to be able to coordinate care with primary care and all of that, is this where we should not put all of our efforts and resources and the CPA is better suited for an outpatient PCMH type of model? What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's an interesting question. <laughs> uh, I think that if we had asked most of the pharmacists in this particular study, they said it we would have gotten bigger bang for our buck for EHR read and write, like the ability to communicate with the prescriber. Um, but then I also think about, you know, we have in Seattle uh, a pharmacy that innovated one step prep and pep for HIV called that pharmacy's Kelly Ross Pharmacy Group. And that whole service is based on uh, their collaborative practice agreement. But on the other hand, a key difference is that is service availability. Um, it is harder to find providers to for uh, HIV prep and PEP than a primary care provider who can initiate a statin. 
Um, right. So that that does come back to the question of what the needs of a community are and not just offering it because we can offer, but because we're closing a gap in what they have access to. It takes us back to the principles of marketing where you design the service as a function of the needs and not as a function of what you have to offer or what you think that people will need and value. But yeah, thank you.